Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Spinks from the University of Wollongong. In this video I'll explain what we've been doing to develop a standard test method for tensile actuators or artificial muscles. The method is simple and quick and it allows the determination of actuation parameters obtained from more traditional tests such as isotonic, isometric and when testing against a spring. Artificial muscles are a type of mechanical actuator designed to apply forces to objects or to move those objects. Like all mechanical actuators, artificial muscles generate a mixture of force and displacement. Sometimes the displacement is called the stroke. The magnitude or the amount of the force and the displacement generated by the artificial muscle depends on two things, the, the material properties and the external forces. For the material properties, the important properties are the free stroke and the stiffness of the actuator in the initial and the final states. In terms of the external loading conditions, the important things are the initial and the final force. Here's an example where the external loading conditions affect the amount of stroke generated, in this case by a pneumatic artificial muscle. When operating against a small load of 50 grams, the actuator can contract by 5 centimetres, but against a heavier load of 1 kilogram, it contracts by only 3.5 centimetres. Here's the direct comparison. Another way to show the effect of external load is to operate in a bicep type configuration where the actuator rotates the lower arm, in this case at 41 degrees, but if we attach the muscle out near the wrist, the range of motion is reduced to only 25 degrees. Again, the external loading conditions are different for the different attachment points, highlighting the need to understand how load affects stroke. So if we have an artificial muscle that contracts in length when it's stimulated, then the initial length of, uh, re represented here by L sub A0 and, and the initial stiffness K sub A change when the actuator is stimulated to the final conditions where the length has changed and probably also the stiffness has changed. When there's no external force applied to the actuator, the change in the actuation length is known as the free stroke. We approach the, the problem of determining the actuation properties by plotting the force extension curves in the initial and final state on the same chart as shown in the top right of this screen. So the force extension curve is similar to the stress-strain curve, except we use force instead of stress and extension instead of strain. The initial force extension curve starts at zero and increases in the positive direction as we stretch the sample, as represented in the blue line. The final uh, force extension curve is, is that that occurs after the stimulus is applied to the artificial muscle. The offset along the x-axis represents the free stroke, in this case a contraction. Now the slope of the initial and final force extension curves represents the stiffness of the material in the initial and the final states. In this case, the stiffness decreases after stimulation, but it doesn't always have to be a decrease, it can increase or it can stay the same. In isotonic actuation, the actuation occurs against a constant external force, for example by attaching a, a, a weight to the sample. So normally we preload the sample by applying a, a load and that would cause stretching as shown in figures O and A. In the force extension curve, we are moving from point O to A on the blue line as we extend the sample and apply a preload. When we apply the stimulus, that occurs at constant load, which sees a transition from the blue to the red force extension curves along the horizontal path represented by the arrow and the symbol delta L sub A. So that's the actuation stroke at a preload of A. This horizontal line diminishes in magnitude as we in increase the preload force applied because the distance between the blue and the red lines in this scenario becomes smaller. So if we plot the actuation stroke under isotonic conditions against the preload force, as shown in the bottom right, the actuation stroke diminishes with increasing preload force. 
This is the case because in this example the stiffness of the sample in the final state is lower than the stiffness in the initial state and the sample undergoes a contraction when stimulated. Isometric actuation occurs at constant length. Again we normally stretch the sample as indicated on the left as we stretch it from 0 to A and, and attach the sample at constant length to a force transducer and then stimulate the sample from A to B. The force generated is indicated by vertical transitions, vertical lines from the blue initial force extension curve to the red final force extension curve. If there's no preloading then the, the force generated is known as the blocked force and given the symbol delta F sub B. If we preload to A we move from 0 to A on the force extension curve in the initial state and the vertical line from A to B indicates the force generated. Again in this situation with a decrease in the stiffness on actuation as well as a contraction we find the force generated decreases with increasing preload force. Many practical actuation, actuation examples operate against a spring. Here we are seeing a spring attached to the actuator in series and as the actuator contracts it not only contracts in length but generates a higher force by stretching the spring. The actuation against the spring can be represented on the force extension curves by overlaying the curves with another line representing the spring extension. The slope of the line A to D in the top right figure represents a spring stiffness. So in this scenario we pre-stretch the actuator from 0 to A and then actuate it where it transitions from A to D along the line representing the spring stiffness of the external spring. So in that way it generates both a, a length contraction and increases the force applied. Again because of the diminishing distance between the final and the initial force extension curves both the force generated and the actuation stroke in this example decrease as the preload force increases. So we now we apply this graphical method for estimating actuation performance against the experimental measured actuation for three types of tensile artificial muscles. All three contract when stimulated. The first is a braided pneumatic muscle where the inflation of internal bladder causes contraction. Second is a shape memory alloy spring which is first stretched then heated to cause contraction. And thirdly a twisted and coiled polymer fiber that actuates by contraction on heating and expansion on cooling. Here we have the experimental results for the braided pneumatic muscle. On the left we see the experimental results for the muscle tested under isotonic conditions where we see a decrease in the length contraction with an increase in the preload force applied. That's shown by the diamonds in the figure. On the right we have the force extension curves in the unpressurized and in the pressurized state. These curves both show hysteresis on loading and unloading. The filled symbols are for loading and unfilled symbols for unloading. When we estimate the isotonic stroke by measuring the horizontal distance between the loading curve and the unpressurized state and the unloading curve in the pressurized state as it represented by the line A to B in the right hand figure, we find there's a close correspondence between that estimated isotonic stroke and the measured isotonic stroke. The dashed line in the figure on the left shows the calculated isotonic strokes determined by the graphical method at different preload forces. There's a good agreement between the estimated isotonic actuation strokes and the measured actuation strokes. Here we see the experimental results for the pneumatic muscle tested under isometric conditions. The force generated decreases slightly with an increase in preload force. The right hand figure shows how we can estimate the force generated by the vertical distance between the loading curve in the unpressurized state and the unloading curve in the pressurized state as represented by the vertical line A to C. When we estimate the blocked force generated at different preload forces we plot that as a dashed line in the left hand figure and see it agrees quite well with the measured 
force generated results. Finally we also tested the pneumatic muscle against a spring in series. The change in length and the force generated are shown in the left hand two figures and the estimation of the force generated and the, the uh, actuation stroke are shown in the right hand figure as the line A to D. The slope of line A to D is the spring stiffness of the external spring. The dashed line in the two left hand figures are the, are the values estimated by that graphical method and you can see they agree very well with the experimental methods. So by using the force extension curves in the pressurised and unpressurised states for the pneumatic muscle we're able to accurately determine the isotonic, isometric and spring actuation results. When we look at the experimental data for the twisted and coiled nylon fibre, we also see that this, the force extension curves show hysteresis on loading and unloading. For these samples, we found that the best agreement between the graphical estimations of actuation and the experimental results occurred when we measured the transition from the unloading curve at 25 degrees Celsius and the unloading curve at 85 degrees Celsius. The left hand figure here shows the experimentally measured change in length under isotonic conditions which is constant with preload force and the dashed line shows the estimated values using the graphical method with a reasonable agreement between the results. Here are the isometric experimental results for the twisted and coiled nylon fibre. On the left are the force generated against preload. There's a small variation with the increasing preload force as shown by the symbols. On the right we see the force extension curves at the two temperatures. The vertical line represented by A to D is our estimation of the force generated at different preload forces and that is shown in the dashed line on the left. Reasonable agreement between the measured values and those estimated using the graphical method from force extension curves. And when we operate the twisted and coiled nylon fibre against a spring in series, we find that there's good agreement between the measured force generated and change in length as shown as in the symbols in the left hand figures and the values estimated using the graphical method represented by the line A to C in the right hand figure. A to C, the slope of that line is the spring stiffness of the external spring and the transition from A to C enables us to calculate both the change in length and the change in force when the actuators operate against that spring. Here's an example of a twisted and coiled polymer fibre that shows an unusual force extension curve. As shown in the left hand curves in this figure, the slope of the curve changes quite significantly. This is due to the fact that during contraction the turns in the coil impact on one another creating residual compressive stress and increasing the apparent stiffness of the fibre. It's important to anneal the twisted and coiled fibres with stretch so that there's sufficient room between turns in the coil to allow contraction and to generate a more linear force extension curve. And now we consider the shape memory alloy spring and the effect of training on the force extension curve at room temperature or at 25 degrees in this case. As shown in the left hand figure, this sequence of tests starts with arrow 1 where the, the fully con contracted spring at room temperature is stretched to about 15 millimetres change in length. It's then heated as indicated by arrow 2 and then loaded and unloaded to generate the force extension curve at 85 degrees Celsius above the transition temperature. It's then cooled as shown by arrow 3 isotonically but it produces an additional change in length an additional extension that is then unloaded as shown by arrow 4 to generate a different force extension curve at 25 degrees C than we started with at the beginning. The force extension curves after different preload forces are shown in the right hand figure. You can see that the force extension curves shift to the right as the initial preloading followed by a heating and cooling cycle is increased.
This means that we don't have a means of universally establishing the force extension curve in the cooled state for these shape memory alloy springs. We have to measure them experimentally. Here are the experimental results for the shape memory alloy spring tested under isotonic conditions at different preload forces. The force extension curves are shown on the left and the change in length, the actuation stroke, is shown on the right as a function of preload forces. The solid diamonds represent the contraction during the first heating cycle. The open diamonds are the expansion during the first cooling cycle and then the filled and open squares are the subsequent contraction and expansion during the second and subsequent cycles. Here are the isometric actuation results for the shape memory alloy spring. On the right we see the actuation results as the force generated as a function of different preload forces. For the first heating cycle in diamonds and the subsequent heating cycles in squares. The force extension curves are shown on the left. We use the force extension curve at room temperature obtained from the isotonic actuation experiments. The first heating cycle is represented by vertical line 2 and the first cooling cycle by vertical line 3 and subsequent heating cooling cycles also by vertical line 3. Using this graphical method we can estimate the force generated at different preload forces and they are shown as dashed lines in the right hand figure. There's good agreement between the estimated values from the graphical method and the measured values. And here are the actuation results for the shape memory alloy spring operated against a spring in series. Again we use the force extension curve in the low temperature state from the isotonic test, the measured values from the isotonic tests. Diagonal line 2 represents the first heating cycle against a spring, 3 the first cooling cycle, and 3 also represents subsequent heating and cooling cycles. The right hand figure shows both the change in length and the force generated for the different cycles. The dashed lines in each figure represent the values estimated by the graphical method, and you can see there's good agreement between the graphical method results and those obtained experimentally. So in summary, we, we recognise that all actuators generate both forces and displacement. And we've seen that the magnitude of the force and displacement depends on the external loading conditions. It would be nice to have a simple method to estimate the actuation force generated and the actuation displacement for all possible loading conditions. Traditional tests generally use the approach of choosing the external loading conditions such as isotonic isometric and so on. We found that by measuring the force extension curves in the initial and final states and overlaying them on the same set of axes provides a graphical method for determining the actuation against isotonic, isometric and spring series actuation. In fact, the actuation could be estimated using this method for any external loading conditions. Complications were noted due to hysteresis and, and also training effects in some of the samples and these require further investigation. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging my former students who contributed to this work and also direct you for further information to our published paper in Sensors and Actuators A. Thanks for listening.